this session. I really want to listen to this. As we begin today's program, I'd like to ask all of you it, um, at the confines of the venue to please stand for Lupang Hinirang to be led by the UP Law Shaiwai. Ito po yung flag natin.
Today's lecture is brought to you by the University of the Philippines Law Center's Institute for the Administration of Justice, which serve um, as the research and training center for the improvement of the administration of justice in the entire Philippines, primarily catering to members of the bar. We conduct MCLEs every month and we have an upcoming AI and uh, the law-themed MCLE, which will start in July 3. You can see the um, enrollment procedures there in our Facebook page and the website of the UP College of Law. The fourth industrial revolution and the technologies that go with it, such as artificial intelligence, big data, and others, not only impact the public at large, but has profound implications for law, policy, and the administration of justice. For this reason, for us at the UP Law Center, awareness and conversations must start. And we are commencing with uh, this, uh, today's lecture on Bitcoin, fueled by blockchains, one of the buzzword technologies of today. During the lecture, we would like to get your comments and questions. We have set up a slider for you. Ayun po. Um, pwede nyo po siyang kopyahin na lang. You can go to, so you can send us and upload, upload your questions that you want Dean Hilby to answer. You can either scan the QR code on the screen or go to slido.com. Uh, you should see a box to input an event code. Sa ilalim po yata yun. You, or you can type UP Law Bitcoin, one word lang po. And the next page is where you can ask and upvote the questions. To introduce our guest lecturer in behalf of the Honorable Justice Francis H. Hardelesa, who regrettably cannot join us this afternoon due to an emergency. Um, let us please welcome our much-loved boss. Sir, totoo naman yun, sir. <laughs> our much-loved boss, Professor Emerson S. Banyas, the director of the Institute for the Administration of Justice. So... Uh, good afternoon, welcome to everyone here, as well as the, uh, those uh, joining us uh, from online. So, I'm going to read a message from Justice uh, Francis Hardilesa. Uh, uh, I'll try my best not to lapse into an impression. <laughs> so, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I have known Dean Corin Hilby since he was a member of UP Law's full-time faculty. This was after he topped the bar and after getting his LLM from Yale. I recruited him into the OSG and he brought with him Prof. Emmer Banyes and a crew of very talented lawyers. In short order, he succeeded me as Solgen and did the country the honor of being the chief lawyer during our arbitration on the WPS against China. After his stint, uh, at the OSG, he had a foray into national politics, but vowed retirement and went into farming. Very fortunately for the legal profession, he lately agreed to accept the deanship at the Siliman University Law School. Welcome once more to the halls of UP Law Florin. We missed you. This afternoon, Dean Florin will introduce us to the topic of cryptocurrency specifically Bitcoin. I was fortunate to have been given the chance to read the manuscript of his book. I assure you once more, Dean Florin has employed the full panoply of his intellectual gifts into a discourse on an interesting, new, and challenging topic. So, thank you and welcome Dean Florin Hilby. Darth Vader. I like it. How does it work? Okay, I'm just trying to test it. Is it working? Wait. 
Uh, anyway, well, while they're trying to fix the, the technical... Nope. Is it just pressed down? Okay, so you know, working? Left, right. Wait. Okay, so uh, uh, Dean Judge Raul Pangalangan, uh, Professor Emerson Banyes, my colleagues in the faculty. You know, you, you'll never know. You, you, you usually don't realize how old you are until you see uh, members of the faculty who are your students who are now uh, mid-level, you know, junior levels of the uh, faculty. And I think the, the dean and the current chancellor of the university was my, my student when I first started teaching here at the, the UP College of Law. At, anyway, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Emerson Banyas for uh, the invite to lecture on a topic that really interests me these days. Uh, Emerson, you know, we've, we've, we've come a long way, uh, was my student. Uh, in constitutional law and a uh, few other theory subjects that I handled when when I taught here at the UP College of Law. Uh, when I became director of the Institute of Government and Law Reform, he was in fact my, my first hire. I pirated him from uh, a, a law office you know, of a colleague actually. <laughs> Uh, and then when I was invited by Solicitor General Francis Hardelesa to join the OSG, uh, I, I brought him with me. So I'm very happy that he's returned to the UP College of Law to, to serve uh, in the academe. Okay, so I only have about one hour to, to discuss this. I can go on and on actually. And so for someone who'd like to discuss Bitcoin, the challenge really is how to compress the presentation in a way that doesn't overwhelm uh, the, the audience. And this is my first presentation, my fifth presentation on the topic. Uh, every time I discuss Bitcoin, I have a different set of uh, slides. And so that, that makes it really fun for me. Uh, it's also a way for me to adjust to the, the audience. And so for, for this particular audience, I think this is my best way of trying to communicate to you uh, what I think uh, Bitcoin is. So I'll uh, the, the title of the presentation is Frameworks for Understanding Bitcoin because Bitcoin is an insanely difficult topic to understand even as it is, in fact, eminently understandable. It's just that you need to spend the time to, to understand it. Uh, it's not a system where, trust us, it works. It's a system that practically invites everyone to, to study it. And so the, the ethic of don't trust verify is applicable in particular to the study of uh, Bitcoin. Uh, it's very difficult to understand because it's inherently multidisciplinary. Uh, you need to go back to your history, uh, your economics, your finance, your banking. Uh, you need to understand some coding, maybe some math as well, uh, finance. Uh, apart from that, <laughs> the you need to unlearn a lot of things. Uh, my my undergraduate is economics, and I taught economics at the University of Santo Tomas. Uh, essentially, everyone's economics is Keynesian economics. Uh, Bitcoin's foundation, on the other hand, is entirely different because it's Austrian in uh, in 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 philosophy, and the the big divide basically is that Keynesian economics is inflationary economics. Uh, it permits, allows, even encourages uh, a certain level of inflation. Uh, Austrian economics essentially says don't touch the money. You need to have sound money from a sound society to be able to build a sound civilization. And so not only do you need to learn a lot of things, you also need to unlearn uh, a lot of things. But don't worry, I think in about a few years time, uh, we will no longer have to study uh, Bitcoin to, to use it. It will become pervasive enough in the same way that you don't need to understand the workings of a car or an airplane to, to use a car or become comfortable riding the, the airplane. You know? 
Okay. Uh, this, I think, is where we are right now. No? Uh, 99% of people, maybe higher than that, uh, do not understand it yet, are very much afraid of uh, what it is, are very much worried about uh, the scams in the quote-unquote cryptocurrency uh, industry, and so they, they really don't want to touch it. No? Uh, even as they see it's the, the value of its token rising, uh, they're still very much worried uh, about it. Uh, where we are right now in the academe, right? Uh, most uh, faculty members will not want to study Bitcoin for, for now. There's also a certain segment of the Bitcoin community uh, that is anti-university. Uh, because they see the university as simply an agent of the state and therefore uh, part of the enemy that must be disrupted. Right? Uh, but for me as an academic, uh, it really is a very interesting uh, topic, uh, not only from a practical standpoint, but also from an academic standpoint because of its ability to integrate uh, various disciplines and provide clarity to a lot of questions about politics and uh, economics. Right, so this is where you are. No? Uh, I think in the first few years of Bitcoin, it was basically uh, a fringe uh, movement among uh, coders, uh, Austrian economists, uh, some philosophers, and some, some investors. After a while, once they uh, saw that the value of the token you know, uh, 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 shoot up, you know, uh, the highs and lows, the higher highs and the higher lows, uh, basically attracted a lot of traders and uh, investors. No? Uh, I think in a few years' time, we'll move towards normality as more and more people understand the use cases of Bitcoin. Uh, I think Bitcoin is one of those phenomenon that you need to feel for yourself for you to be able to understand it. It's possible to uh, study it from an academic standpoint uh, with a distance, but the, the best way really to understand what it is and what it's going to do to the world is by, by, by using it. And so in my book, for example, I recommend to everyone to buy 37 pesos worth of Bitcoin just to start uh, using the, uh, the Lightning wallets. No? Uh, to, to internalize, basically, uh, the use of this uh, new form of money. Right. Uh, what is Bitcoin? Uh, for Bitcoiners like, like myself uh, and for a few of those who are familiar here, Bitcoin is simply money. And what is money? It's something that you use for payments. Right? It's something that you use for savings. It's as simple as that. No? But precisely because there are so many things you need to understand, to see Bitcoin as money, right? Uh, we need to still read, you know, books. No? Okay. Uh, what is my mission? Uh, my my mission, basically, as an academic, is to convince my colleagues in uh, the faculty and in the various departments uh, to see Bitcoin as a normal area of concern, something that uh, they should apply their creative juices to because uh, it can provide a wealth of insights and new understandings. Uh, it can provide new research areas. Right? Uh, given its disruptive ability, I think it will also create new paths for uh, scholars, uh, researchers. And I'm rather confident that in a few years' time, you know, you, you'll have uh, faculty members updating their outline uh, if you're looking for a parallel, it's similar to someone in the early 90s telling you about computers talking to one another. Uh, if you're looking for a parallel. But at the same time, be open to the possibility that Bitcoin just might be even bigger than the internet, which I think it is. Okay, so for this particular presentation, I'll give you 13 frameworks, basically 13 approaches to understanding uh, Bitcoin. The goal is not to 
do a deep dive for every framework. Uh, it's to give you a sense of what it is and what it can do. Uh, essentially, to pique everyone's interest and make, make people realize that, okay, this is not a, a, a scam. This is something that can I can approach from a purely intellectual uh, uh, angle. Right. So the first framework is to separate Bitcoin the network from Bitcoin the token. Uh, Bitcoin is one entire network, of course, but analytically, right, the network is separable from the token. Whenever someone talks to you about Bitcoin, uh, that person is probably talking about the token. Uh, most Bitcoiners uh, or those into uh, cryptocurrencies are essentially traders. Those who are fixated and excited with the price action or the, the fiat value of Bitcoin. Um, and in fact, you can do trading without understanding what the network is. But the really interesting part about this phenomenon is the network. And the more you understand the network, the easier to understand the, the fiat value of uh, Bitcoin. Uh, from a trader's perspective, uh, why is Bitcoin volatile? Uh, number one, because of the level of adoption. Number two, the level of speculation. But from the network perspective, Bitcoin is entirely stable and not volatile at all. Why? Because those 21 million Bitcoins are not changing forever. It's just going to stay there. So if you're looking at it from the outside, from uh, the, sta the, the standpoint of the fiat system, you will see Bitcoin as very volatile because the fiat value, the price in dollars or pesos is moving upwards and downwards very fast on a daily basis. But if you're within a different universe, the Bitcoin universe, you'll be at peace, <laughs> calm, right? You will see the dollar system or the fiat system as the one that's very volatile, right? Uh, because of the monetary de debasement. So that's the first, uh, the first framework. Now try to focus on the network rather than the fiat price of the token. Right. Uh, okay, the second framework is uh, try to understand Bitcoin as a separate monetary system. What do you mean by that? Okay, uh, you have two monetary systems right now, the, the fiat system and the Bitcoin uh, system. The fiat system is essentially the dollar system at the top, right? With all the other currencies, right? Uh, trading against the dollar. The dollar is the most liquid uh, uh, currency, right? If you wish to trade, uh, locally or internationally, you need to have access to dollars. That means you need to jump into a highway system controlled by the United States, essentially. And so the dollar system is, or all types of systems or monetary systems, uh, can be viewed as a highway system or uh, the veins, right? Or the arteries of a, a, a human body. It's a, it's a network of transmitting value. Uh, the dollar system or the fiat system is a system that is controlled by states. It's essentially the union of money and state. It's a permission rail system. So if you're looking at the highway, uh, these are the central banks, uh, the commercial banks, the private banks. You know. Every time you move into that particular architecture, that highway, uh, you are policed, monitored, supervised by, uh, by governments. Why? Because they're the ones who, along with private companies, have created that international system. If you wish to export, if you wish to import, if you wish to use the dollar, you need to trade it for pesos, you're basically right, uh, jumping into that particular permission system. That is the nature of the fiat system. It's a relationship between governments and the form of money that we use today. On the other hand, the Bitcoin system is just code, right? It's a permissionless system. 
it's entirely separate from the state by design. When you get into the Bitcoin network, right, there will be no states, there will be no central banks, there will be no commercial banks. That's one way to approach it. It's an entirely separate monetary system. Uh, the traders, what do they do? Uh, they jump on and off those different highway systems. Whenever you sell your Bitcoin for dollars or pesos, you're moving into a different highway system, right? From Bitcoin to fiat is essentially from a permissionless rail system or highway to a permissioned highway. When you sell your dollars for Bitcoin, you enter a universe that is permissionless, where the state doesn't exist, where everyone is equal, essentially. And so you can, uh, you can label the fiat system as essentially a system of government monies or currencies or a communications network for transferring value under the supervision and regulation of states and the banks that they regulate. And you have another system, the Bitcoin monetary system, which is a permissionless system where all actors are essentially the same. It's blind to the regulation of the state. By design, it also cannot be regulated. Today, the states can regulate the on-ramps and the off-ramps, right? So if you are buying Bitcoin, for example, you go to an exchange, uh, there's AML, there's, there's KYC, uh, you need to submit your names and photos to the exchange. But once you get your Bitcoin from that exchange, you're outside of that particular system. You can move within the Bitcoin network in a way that cannot be regulated by the state. Bitcoin is a public blockchain, and so to some extent they can see what you're doing, but it's a pseudonymous right, uh, system. It's just numbers and letters or code. No? There's no Raul Pangalangan transferring one Bitcoin to one address to another or Professor Emerson Banyas no? uh, transferring two Bitcoins from one address to, to another. Right? They can do that through the rail system, the on-ramps and the off-ramps, but if you're able to move within the Bitcoin system, you will practically be invisible. Okay, so that's how I describe it. No? Uh, a, a system of permission rails to a system of permissionless rails. Right, framework number three. No? Uh, the way to understand, or one way to understand Bitcoin is by understanding the fiat system. What is the fiat system? Right? Uh, what is Bitcoin competing with? What is Bitcoin, well, it's not attempting to do anything. What will Bitcoin probably disrupt? It's called the fiat system. The fiat system is a system of transferring and moving value by order of the government. Fiat is by government. Right. Uh, the easiest way to understand the fiat system is by understanding what happened in 1971. In 1971, the world moved to a very interesting and actually rather dangerous experiment. Uh, in 1971, right, uh, United President, U.S. President Nixon uh, severed the tie between gold and the dollar, right? And therefore severed the tie between money and currency. Prior to 1971, right, uh, all monies were basically backed by something, and that is gold. Gold, which is considered money by, has been considered money by human beings and civilizations for thousands of years. No? Starting 1971, or effectively in 1973, that tie was severed, which means that for about half a century now, we've been undergoing this rather inter interesting experiments where all forms of money are basically just pieces of paper backed by confidence in governments. Prior to that, currencies were real currencies in the sense that they were backed by something humans considered money, and that is gold. Every time you have, every time you do an exchange, whether 
your labor or goods and services or goods that you have produced and you want to get paid, you will not want to get paid with paper, right? By, by someone or by, uh, by a stranger. The only, the only way you will accept that paper is if that paper represented something. Before, that was gold. If you go to a bank and deposited something or sold a certain type of property, you're not going to accept a piece of paper from a bank. You're going to accept a piece of paper from a bank backed by something that is gold. Uh, if you have a transaction with the government, you're not going to transact with the government using paper. You're going to receive something from the government which is backed by something. That has always been gold. Why? Because human beings have considered gold as, well, real money, whereas all forms of currencies are just pieces of paper representing gold. Okay. Uh, this is my conversation basically with Dean Raul Pangalangan. Right? Uh, what is money? Money is a system of trust and confidence. Right? It's not the paper. It's not the gold. The gold is simply a token. It's a system, a human system of trust and confidence that that particular token, whether it's that piece of paper or that token called gold, is trustworthy enough to exchange value. Right. If you go look at the old forms of currencies, you will see they always say it's redeemable in gold, right? So all these types of paper, right? all these types of money are simply representations of the real thing, which is gold. Under the gold standard, all forms of money are simply currencies backed by gold. It's not the paper that matters, it's what is in the paper that's matter, uh, that, that really matters. It's what the paper represents, right? So it's always gold. Uh, it's the same thing with this form of money. Right, what happened? Uh, the broken promise of Bretton Woods. No? After the Second World War, uh, the US became uh, the most successful manufacturer of the world, just like China is today. Uh, it also won the war, and along with its allies, it was able to establish a new uh, financial system. And that financial system was based on the dominance of the dollar. The United States was able to convince everyone, basically, to sell their gold to them in exchange for paper, which is dollar, at the rate of $35. And so the promise was, if you gave us all your gold, we will exchange it for dollars so long as, and we will be able to redeem it at the rate of $35 per ounce. That was the promise. Uh, you can trust us, right? Because we will exchange your money, our dollar, for gold. Right? Uh, by 1960s, the United States became very active in world affairs and in uh, certain aspects of its domestic affairs. So the the guns and butter policy, uh, Vietnam War, uh, the rise of uh, social policies which are very expensive, the expansion of the bureaucracies, and that led the United States to print a lot of money. Right? And the, the printing got noticed by the Europeans who called uh, the, what, the privilege of the dollar as the, the exorbitant privilege. Uh, if a country can print its own currency, that, that country is a sovereign country. If another country can print your country, then uh, your currency, then your country is simply a colony. Right? Uh, but with the United States printing a lot of money, right, it was basically exporting its inflation. A country printing a lot of money for itself is debasing its money, stealing from the people but a country printing its own money and exporting it to others because it's a world reserve currency allows it to buy goods and services, meaning things in the real world, with paper. Right? And so uh, Charles de Gaulle, for example, famously uh, uh, offered to send uh, a naval fleet to the United States to get all its gold. Right? 
And so once they started losing trust in the dollar, they started redeeming their gold. And at some point, the United States was not able to defend the $35 price of gold because the price of gold would necessarily rise as more redemptions happen, right? Uh, if, if it, well, to its, if it happened up until the end, right? If this continued on and on, the result would be the United States would lose all its gold and would be left with paper money, its dollar. So in 1971, they broke the promise of Bretton Woods of redeeming dollar at $35, right? And this is the, the Nixon shock. Bitcoiners are very familiar with this. No? Uh, in 1971, President Nixon said, uh, there are too many speculators uh, attacking the dollar. I'm going to suspend the convertibility of the dollar to gold. So starting 1971, we've gone on to this very interesting experiment, right? Uh, where monies have been unbacked by gold. It's the pure fiat uh, system. This is the system that we have today. Right, right so after 1971, this is your dollar now. It no longer represents gold. Why? Because it's no longer redeemable in gold. Uh, this is your peso, right? Our peso is much, much more honest. Uh, ang salaping ito ay bayarin ng Banco Central. Uh, meaning, this piece of paper is an obligation of the central bank. An obligation to what? To pay the same paper money, essentially. Whereas before, the obligation was to convert it or redeem it for a dollar. Right? Today, it's an obligation that it will be acceptable in our jurisdiction because it's considered legal tender. If a merchant refuses to receive legal tender, then we'll send the police and arrest that person. Why? Because legal tender laws is essentially paper backed by government force. Right. Okay. Uh, of course, the Americans knew that without you know, uh, the world reserve currency status, uh, their, uh, their money printing would have to stop. And so they found basically a way out of it or to maintain the, the dollar dominance. And this is the petrodollar system. A lot of books have been written about it. A lot of people have written about it. I'm not inventing the, the petrodollar system. So in 1971, uh, Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger uh, entered into an agreement with the uh, Saudis, right? Uh, for protection of the Saudis in exchange for their protection, uh, the Saudis would only sell their oil in dollars, meaning exclusively sell their oil in dollars. Uh, within a few years, everybody followed this particular model, and this is, to some extent, still alive and dominant system, the petrodollar system. So whereas before the dollar was backed by uh, gold, after 1971 with this agreement, the dollar became able to free ride on oil because everybody needed oil. Everybody who needed oil had to buy dollars. Whereas before, everybody had to buy dollars because dollar, the dollar was the world reserve currency as per the Bretton Woods Agreement. After 1971, the dollar became the world reserve currency because everybody needed oil. And so the petrodollar system was born. Uh, if you try to study what's happened to the U.S. economy, the economy of China, it's a system called the petrodollar recycling, where everybody who sells to the U.S. goods and services, oil, uh, manufactured goods, right, are able to invest in United States companies, right, uh, with the use of their surplus dollars. And so the United States, from becoming the world's manufacturer, became essentially a financial sector with a very powerful military. Uh, they essentially had to export their manufacturing because with all the investments in the United States, the prices of labor, uh, real estate went up. It's no longer sustainable for them to have uh, a traditional manufacturing sector. Right, so 
from 1971 onwards, the world moved from an asset-based monetary system, meaning a monetary system based on gold, to a debt-based monetary system. A monetary system based on U.S. treasuries. How does it work? Right? Uh, the United States and other governments will have to survive, and the way they do it is by issuing debt instruments called U.S. treasuries, redeemable in dollar. And what is the payment for those obligations? Not gold, but basically more dollar, more and more dollars. This is why under mainstream economics, you need to have inflation. You need to have an expansion of the money supply because debt has to be repaid with more debt. And at some point, that system is going to elapse because it's simply unsustainable. Right. Uh, framework number four. The way to understand Bitcoin is by understanding gold. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, what's so special about gold? There. It's scarce and rare. Right. Uh, this is a, a an Olympic size swimming pool, swimming pool, a regular house, a truck. Right. That is all the gold that's been mined by human beings. Right? It's that rare. So if you have gold, that means you have something that is very rare in the entire universe. You also have something which is a product that required a lot of energy to produce, whether as coin or as a bar. Right? right. Uh, what is the special characteristic of gold? Uh, there's a delay here. Right. It's essentially just honest money. Uh, unlike fiat money, which can be printed by governments, gold cannot be printed by governments. Right? Uh, no alchemy has been invented to create gold. So when you have this particular token called gold, you can be sure that it's an honest form of token meaning no one can create more of it other than what they can find on Earth or in space, right? And manufacture right, uh, into a coin or gold. So gold is a very good token for monetary exchanges or exchanging value. Why? Because if you want to engage in trading, you will want a form of money that cannot be manipulated. And that is gold. Well, you can manipulate the price of gold, but you cannot manipulate the supply of gold itself. Right? So what is money? Money is essentially just a ruler, a way to measure the price of goods and services. And so the moment you see money as simply as a form of a ruler, right, uh, you will become a sound money advocate. Why? If you're building a house, you wouldn't want your laborers to have different measuring tools. You wouldn't want one laborer measuring a ruler as 12 inches and another laborer using a ruler with 13 inches. You're not going to have a stable house. It's exactly the same for building a monetary system. It's exactly the same for building a society. It's exactly the same for making markets work. If everybody had different scales, you'd have a lot of cheating. You're not, go you're not gonna have an honest market, then you're gonna have disorder in your markets. Right, gold, however, has certain problems. Okay, number one, it's not that divisible, right? Very hard to divide. Uh, you also have problems with authentication. There's a lot of fake gold. Right, uh, I think Goldman Sachs was caught lately, right, uh, having several what, uh, several tons of uh, of gold bars, right, uh, with with copper inside. Uh, so it's very hard to authenticate. The only way to authenticate gold is by melting it. And can you imagine a market trying to do that? No, that will destroy the velocity of transactions and the confidence of the market participants. It's also not mobile, right? Uh, prior to the modern era, maybe 
gold would have worked as a system for payments, coins and, and bars. But uh, in the 20th century, right, uh, with the rise of uh, steamships, uh, transportation, right, uh, by air, uh, especially today with a globally connected network, right, uh, you cannot have gold as a, a standard for uh, monetary payment. But I think the, the worst problem for gold is that it's susceptibility to state capture. You see, gold is simply a token. It's not a network. The ones who need to build the network to create the financial infrastructure that make gold possible as a valuation mechanism for the entire world will have to be created by human beings. And when you give the network to human beings, you're going to have different types of manipulation. You're going to politicize the entire the rail system. right? And that's exactly what's happened to gold. That's why gold today is simply a store of value. Right. right. Framework number five. Uh, it's important to see Bitcoin as a communications network. Right. Uh, what is a communications network? Oops, sorry. Right. Okay. Uh, if you're on your own, you know, thinking your thoughts, uh, making food for yourself, uh, you should be good to go, right? But the moment you go social, you start interacting with a human being or with one another, you're going to need to have a communication system, whether it's for ideas, whether it's for value. Right? So... Every social interaction requires a communications network. Um, and every communications network, if they are competing, will have to compete over speed, cost, and fidelity. If there's one takeaway for this lecture today, it should be this. Right? Speed, cost, fidelity. All communications networks, all social networks compete for cost, speed and fidelity. Uh, if I'm sending a message, right, right, am I gonna send it by voice or by letter or via the post office or via email or via Viber? Right? Uh, if I'm sending a video, right, will I send it through VHS or Betamax, uh, VCD, DVD, or through the internet. Right? If I want to listen to good music, uh, am I going to listen to a cassette tape or vinyl or through uh, VCD, through a lossy file, MP3, or through a lossless file, WAV file? It's all about that, right? It's all about the quality of the communications network, which is about the quality of a medium. Whether it's voice, whether it's ideas, whether it's money, whether it's, mu whether it's music. It's all about this, right? So when we talk about, you know, Bitcoin fixing the money and fixing the world, it's not a theoretical claim. It's not a normative claim even. It's an empirical claim that Bitcoin as a social communications network has the speed, right, and the cost and the fidelity advantage, right, to outcompete every other payment system, every other money in the world, right. Uh, it's digital native, so it's very fast. With the Lightning Network, Bitcoin transactions are much, much faster than Visa, right? The cost of transaction, uh, there's a company that's set up in Boracay, right? Uh, they're doing remittances from the U.S. to the Philippines. The average cost of remittances from the U.S. to the Philippines is uh, between 4.5% and 10%. That's about $12.7 billion of remittances from the Philippines to the U.S. On the Bitcoin network, that's about 1% to less than 1%. Imagine the amount of value 
that you will shift from the payments processors to the recipients. Right? And so people are going to shift to Bitcoin now because Bitcoin is cool or you know, Bitcoin is internet native because it's cheap, it's fast. More importantly, people will shift to Bitcoin because it's high fidelity transmission, meaning no inflation. And that's the, I think, the killer app of Bitcoin. Uh, for massive adoption, it's the cost because people don't care about the payment system that they, they use. They, they care much about the cost of transmitting value. And if it's cheaper, they will go there. Uh, whereas those who have wealth, those who want to transfer value from today to next week to next year, those who want to transfer value from themselves to their heirs will want a type of monetary network that is high fidelity, meaning that doesn't degrade. Inflation is the degradation of value, essentially, right? But if your money is doesn't degrade, right? It's a high fidelity transmission mechanism using, uses a high fidelity transmission mechanism, then you will want to transmit value there. It's as easy as that. No? Uh, the goal is always energy efficiency, right? Uh, if I'm a laborer and I'm transmitting value, right? And the cost of transmission is very high, then I'm spending a lot of energy to transmit value from one place to another, from one person to another. If the, the speed of transmission is very high, right, I'm not gonna do that. If sending money from my house to a relative in Baler would require me to take the Jeep or the tricycle, go to Luillier, fill up the forms, wait for 30 minutes and get a confirmation by text, right? And the alternative is use my phone and transfer within five seconds, then I'm not going to go to Luillier. <laughs> it's as easy as that. Why? Because I'm trying to conserve energy, right? Uh, if, I'm, if I'm a laborer, right, I will want the value of my minimum wage to be preserved, right? Minimum wage is minimum wage, right? But if that minimum wage is corroded by inflation, what, 5%, 10%, 20% per year. And there's another system that says we have cured that particular disease called inflation. Then people will shift to that monetary system. Right, so, well, this part of the lecture for college students. No? Uh, what is Bitcoin? No? Uh, it's peer-to-peer. -peer. No intermediary. When you use your Gcash, you send to your friend or family, right? You think it's peer-to-peer, -peer, but it's really not. You know, you're sending to a centralized server controlled by the banks, supervised by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, right? When you're sending from one Bitcoin wallet to another, you're sending from one computer to another. It's purely peer-to-peer. -peer. There's no all-seeing eye. There's no supervisor or regulator by design. When you're sending through the banking system, you're basically sending debts, right? Uh, and we know this from credit transactions. When you deposit your money to a bank, you're doing a loan transaction. You're not doing a deposit transaction. You're giving your money to the bank. The bank will acquire ownership over your money, will owe you a debt, right, that you can recall. If it's a demand deposit, then you can recall it anytime. But because it's the bank's money, they can place certain restrictions on your ability to withdraw that money. Like what? Uh, 200,000 limit per day or 20,000 peso withdrawal limit if it's an ATM. If you're doing a transaction on the Bitcoin network, you can transfer all the money you have. Right? You can receive as many Bitcoins as you can receive. There are no restrictions. And those are assets that you're receiving, not IOUs. No? Uh, here, no, going back to the, the metaphor of a highway, right? Uh, uh, the peso system, the central, uh, 
the, the money that we have right now, the fiat, is local money. Right? Uh, for you to be able to use your peso abroad, you will need to go to a foreign exchange merchant who will get what? Anywhere between 1% and 5% of that value to exchange it to the local fiat money available in that area. Right? So it's all foreign exchanges everywhere you go, every time you cross jurisdiction. With Bitcoin, I can send Satoshis today to anywhere in the world without any exchange transactions. It's a global system. I can cross every jurisdiction in the world with my Satoshis. I don't need any permission rail because it's a permission system. Right. <laughs> uh, your, your Gcash, Paymaya, you know, sometimes they're down for maintenance purposes. Uh, and you have no idea what those maintenance uh, purposes are, right? You need to trust them because that is their company. It's a private company. Uh, Bitcoin has been online 99.99% since it went online. Right? So in case of an emergency, you'd probably trust your Bitcoin more than your uh, Gcash. Right. Uh, whenever you do a transaction or when you enter uh, the banking system, you need to provide a lot of information. There's uh, KYC requirements. Uh, when I became Dean of Siliman, I had to uh, open a bank account. So I brought my secretary who's a re retired uh, supervisor from one of the local banks. Right? Uh, I gave her 50 pesos worth of Bitcoin and she was so surprised you know, how fast I was able to do that. So I said, you know, accompany me when I open a bank account. It took us 45 minutes to open a bank account. They got so many details from me, either, even my mother's name, you know. They took my photos, uh, they got my number, my email address, emergency contact numbers. And so after the, the ordeal, <laughs> right, uh, I told my secretary, you think they can survive with Bitcoin? Right. Uh, fiat money, the nature of fiat money is that it can be expanded or contracted. But by design, it's really meant to expand because it's a debt-based system. Right? Uh, Bitcoin, on, on the other hand, is the value proposition is 21 million Bitcoins forever. Right? It's the design of the network to be sound money in the digital realm. <coughs> right. Uh, we've already discussed this. Right. Okay. Uh, fiat, how do you carry fiat with coins uh, or with, with paper money? Uh, now you can have digital fiat, right? Um, but with Bitcoin, it's just 12, 12 words in your head. So you can liquidate all your assets today, go to any jurisdiction, get a phone, right? Uh, use your private keys, you have a Bitcoin, and then you can liquidate it and buy property, right? a house or get food. Right? Uh, okay, uh, the, the supply of fiat money is always just an estimate, right? always just an estimate. Uh, Bitcoin, on the other hand, by design is verifiable. You can check the time, uh, the time chain and you can find it there. You can find all the transactions there from the time. The first transaction was uh, 10 Bitcoin from Satoshi Nakamoto to Hal Finney. It's still there. Right. Uh, divisibility, one Bitcoin is divisible to 100 million Satoshis. Uh, because of its divisibility, it will change the consumption and production uh, habits of human beings. Whenever the consumption and production of information and value changes, you have a revolution in how human beings live, right? The will, the printer, the internet, Bitcoin, they're all the same. Right? Okay, uh, the monetary policy, the, the, the job of every central bank basically is to 
for lack of a better word, to manipulate the money supply. Right? Uh, it's to expand the money supply and control the interest rates. Right? Essentially to control the money supply. Uh, the money supply of Bitcoin is immutable. It's not going to change forever. Right? So just by looking at the characteristics of these communications networks, right, uh, you, can, you can make a reasonable judgment about which communications network is going to win. That's it. That's the basic thesis of every Bitcoiner. I was about to out you. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Right, okay. Why is Bitcoin so important? Is it just a, a communications protocol? Wow, that's exciting, right? Uh, that's exciting. Uh, well, this is the first time, well, actually the second time I'm presenting this uh, view of Bitcoin from a civilizational perspective. Every species needs to survive and thrive. Right? And the way they do that is by having information exchange protocols. Right? Every species. That is the function of sex. Right? Uh, sex is about information exchange so that after that information exchange, exchange of DNA, you can have a successor with a new set of DNA that can survive in an uncertain environment. So species survive through information exchange and that is through sex, right? That is also how they evolve. Uh, human beings on the other hand, okay, are rather special because somehow, notwithstanding our frail constitution, we're very weak. Right? Uh, our carbon-based bodies are very weak and frail. We have been able to dominate the planet. You know? How do you explain that? You know? The way to explain it is our ability to have non-DNA-based information exchange mechanisms. Right? So for every other species on the planet, for them to survive and thrive, they need to have sex. We also need to have sex. <laughs> we also want a lot of it. But Beyond that information exchange mechanism, we have two other information exchange protocols. That's very important for building communities, scaling to societies, and ossifying into civilizations. So you have two foundational protocols for every civilization. Language and money, right? Language is an information exchange protocol for exchanging ideas. Money is an information exchange protocol for exchanging value. They are the same. They are exchange protocols, and so they are analytically identical. When you talk of money, you can talk about language. When you analyze language, you can use the same tools for analysis to understand money. Right, so uh, many Bitcoiners don't know this because they hate the university system. Right. So for money, right, you can build. So I think, right. So uh, right. Oh, one more. Here, uh, Dean Roll would be very familiar with Benedict Anderson, of course, right. Uh, how do you create nations? The way, the easiest way to create nations is to build communities right, bound by a social network called language. And so with the use of language, right, people are able to speak the same culture, people are able to understand one another, and therefore build a social network, imagine a community. Once that community is able to scale, create the idea of a nation. Right? Not race, but a purely artificial construct called a nation. The same thing is true with money, right? Uh, with money, with a token and a network, you can create markets. Markets that can uh, be as big as a barangay to as large as a city to something as large as a global market, which is what we have today, right? So it's the same thing. With the money, you can create 
communities. And all of them are imagined communities. So these are foundational protocols in the sense that for you to have a stable civilization, you need to have working idea exchange protocol and a working value exchange protocol. If you destabilize your language, you're going to have problems. If you destabilize your money, you're going to have problems. I can already see Dean Pangala <laughs> thinking about the consequences. Right. So the way we speak about money is exactly the same way we can talk about language. Right? Uh, money is a medium of exchange. Right? Same thing is true with idea. Language is a medium of exchange. I'm exchanging ideas through books, through words, through poetry. Uh, it's also a store of value. My book is a store of value. A library is a very good store of value. You want your money to have to be a very good store of value so that you can transmit that value through time and through space, right? To one person, from one person to the next, right? Today and then tomorrow and the next generation. So they are transmission mechanisms, essentially. You want a unit of account. Uh, I see a building as costing a certain amount of dollars or pesos or Bitcoin. You don't see it as a certain number of cattle or salt right? or ships or any other form of value. Right? So language is also a unit of culture. Right? We have access to American culture because of our history as a colony. Right? Uh, you have access to German poetry because it's been translated. That's your access to that particular culture. If you don't have the form of dominant money today, you cannot engage in good, in exchanges of goods and services. You need to have that kind of money. And today, that is still the dollar, right? For you to be able to export and import, you need to have dollars. And that is how you, you view the world. The same way that you view the world in terms of dollars, we view the world in terms of Western culture, precisely because of that access to that particular language. Right? Uh, if we've been conquered by Russians, we'd be Russian speaking. Right? Uh, okay, so stable language, that's the, well, if you're a lawyer, you either hate this or like, or, 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 or like this, right? Uh, we want meeting of the minds so that we can have stable contracts. Uh, we want meeting of the minds so you can have stable platform for interpreting the Constitution. Right? You want meeting of the minds so that uh, the workings of a corporation can be outlined and properly communicated to the stockholders. What happens when you have unstable language? Right? Uh, litigation. Right? Uh, lack of communication. Right? Disorder and chaos. So this is what's going to happen, right? Uh, the Tower of Babel, right? Uh, human beings wanted to reach heaven, right? Uh, the only thing that God did was to create a confusion of tongues, right? To destroy their community, right? So this is the consequence of stable money. You can have a stable market. Why? Because the, the measure doesn't change, right? If you have... Uh, stable money, you'll have a savings culture. If your money is being debased very fast, that's a trigger for you to consume. That's a trigger for you to dump your money for something else, whether it's stocks, bonds, real estate, or the new iPhone. But if your money is stable, if your money is not being debased, then you have that powerful option to think about the future by saving. Uh, what is unstable money? This, right? The fall of Rome. Right? Uh, from a once powerful civilization, they continually debased their currency for a period of about 300 years, right? They sunk everyone to the Dark Ages. That's how you destroy societies, by destabilizing either the language or the monetary system. So the consequences are, well, quite massive. 
Uh, this is the fast version, hyperinflation. Right? Uh, what happened to Germany in 1923? What happened to Zimbabwe in the 1980s? What's happening to Venezuela, Argentina? And what's going to happen more and more often because uh, the money supply gets expanded more and more by governments without discipline. Right, so let's go to the next framework, uh, the problem of inflation, uh, which Friedrich Hayek basically said, the whole history of civilization is a history of inflation, right? I didn't know until I understood what he meant. Right? Uh, so this is inflation. Uh, inflation is the expansion of the money supply. Uh, the, the increase in prices is essentially just a lagging indicator, the consequences of the expansion of the money supply. Uh, it's as simple as this. No? Uh, in, a, in a 10 mango economy, you have 100 pesos. If you expand the money supply to 1,000 pesos, you will have an inflation. Right? The prices of goods and services will go up. It's as simple as that. Uh, but inflation is essentially defined as, ex as an expansion of the money supply. Uh, this is the money supply of the, the Philippines from the 1970 to the 2020s. The United States from 1960s to the present. No? Uh, they're going to the moon. <laughs> they're going parabolic. Uh, in, in, in Bitcoin language, they're destroying their currency. And we all know the consequence of a society destroying the currency or debasing the currency. It's destroying the, the, the society. If it's slow debasement, it's slow decay. If it's very fast debasement via quantitative easing, for example, then that's very fast decay of society. OK, how do you debase the money? Uh, the three general ways, coin clipping, that's why the coins have ridges to indicate that they have not been clipped, right? Uh, another is uh, what the Romans did, reminting the coin. Uh, give us the coins, we'll remint it, and then they'll reduce the gold or the silver content. They did that over and over again for a period of 300 years, no? from 95% to about 1% content. By the time they were done, you know, Rome was done as well. Uh, today, of course, the, the easiest way, way to do it is by pressing the enter button, no? uh, pressing uh, the return button, money printing, uh, because it can be done digitally today. Okay, I'm running out of time. Okay, so here, gold has a natural inflation. By natural inflation, I mean the amount of gold being added to the current supply. Uh, it's anywhere between 1.5 and 2.5 percent, right? So that's natural inflation. Uh, fiat money is political inflation, whatever it is that the politicians, the bureaucrats uh, want, right? And Bitcoin, it's fixed money supply, right? Okay, the other problem with inflation is the Cantillon effect. No? Every time you increase the money supply, the increase in money supply doesn't go proportionately to all the money holders. When the money supply is increased, it goes first to the ones closest to the printer, the ones who have access to the government, the ones who have access to the banking system. Why? Because they're the ones who have access to new credit. And if the interest rate is very low, that basically means free money. So if the interest rate is very low, I can get access to new money. I can use that money to buy corporations, buy real estate, bonds, and stock. What am I doing if I do that? I'm basically dumping the new money in exchange for real goods. And the ones who will suffer from the inflation, right, when the money gets actually debased, are the fixed income holders or the fixed income savers, uh, minimum wage earners, middle class those who don't have access to a lot of money. Uh, this is what? The machine that destroys societies, basically. The Kantian effect. When the money gets inflated, 
right? You will see a disparity in asset holdings by the property holders. The level of inequality will have to rise up every time you destroy the money. This is exactly what's happening today. The rise of inequality that fuels, you know, societal chaos. Framework number nine. You know, uh, the way to understand wars is by understanding the money. Right? Uh, every war has a front end, right? This is what you see every time you see wars, right? Uh, machines and armies. There's a back end to that. Oops. How do you fund the war, right? These are the traditional ways. You tax the population. They're going to hate that, right? You issue war bonds. You invite the population to invest in the war effort. They become stakeholders in the war effort. If you have a popular cause, then you can convince the population to do that. Or you use your savings if the nation has resources in gold or in other reserve assets. The back door is by inflating the money supply. When you inflate the money supply, you have more money. You're basically stealing from the population. You're taxing them without them knowing it. That's why inflation is a tax. People don't see inflation as a tax, but it is a tax. It's a tax on their labor, right? If there's an inflation rate of 10%, that means you lost the value of your wages by 10%. Someone took that 10%, it goes somewhere. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, the story of World War I. Prior to World War I, everybody was, or the West was on a gold standard, meaning disciplined money. Uh, all their monies, uh, the dollar, the pound, the mark, right, were basically exchange rates for dollar. Right? The dollar is a particular weight in gold, the mark was a particular weight of gold, right? And the franc was a particular weight of gold. It's not the paper that matters, but its weight in gold, what it represents in terms of gold. Uh, wars trigger monetary debasement. So during the First World War, everybody debased their currency. They went off the gold standard, right? 1960s and 1970s, this is the Bretton Woods era. Uh, the United States, you know, printed a lot of money. Uh, that's why the Europeans complain. No? Uh, they call it an extraction. Why? Because for everybody to be able to uh, get the dollar, you need to exchange it for something else, right? Your natural resources, uh, the produce of your people, human labor. But for a country with world reserve status, all they have to do is to print the money. Why? Because if they can print the money, they can export their inflation. So the, the priced possession of empires is not the colony, but lingua franca and world reserve currency. Right? With lingua franca, you can control everybody's culture. With world reserve currency, you can print your money and export that money to everybody else. Uh, BRICS, right? Uh, if you're following world events, right, uh, you will notice that uh, Russia, uh, China, right, Saudi Arabia, right, uh, they've entered into an agreement to sell oil, right, uh, and natural resources, not anymore in dollars. And so we might be entering an era of de-dollarization. And that is a very dangerous era because uh, the United States might be weakening, you know, uh, in terms of its economic might, but it's still the most powerful army in the world with the most nuclear weapons, right? And, you know, uh, no empire has given its privileges that easily. So this is very dangerous because we're shifting to uh, a world where the dollar might no longer be the world reserve currency. And what do you think will be the best form of money between enemies? <laughs> A neutral form of currency. Someone that nobody can tamper with. Bitcoin is peace. 
Right, so what did Bitcoin solve? So this is framework number 10. Am I still good, Amber? Thank you. Uh, right, uh, the Byzantine general's problem or the centralization of money. That was what was solved by uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, when the internet was born, right, everybody was happy. In the digital realm, uh, you can copy and paste anything and everything. That's good for uh, ideas. That's good for music. That's good for videos. It disrupted the incumbents for sure, but it produced decentralization of knowledge. Uh, Wikipedia would be footnote number one, uh, for example. The problem was how do you do that with money? And so for the longest time, you know, uh, computer engineers thought that this was an unsolvable problem. And this is exactly what Satoshi Nakamoto was able to solve. No? Uh, through the Bitcoin white paper, he was able to solve the problem of centralization. Prior to Bitcoin, right, uh, the way to use digital money in the internet was through an intermediary. A bank, basically. So it's the bank that has the ledger. It polices everybody's transactions to maintain the honesty of the ledger. Without the bank, everybody would print their own money, and it's not going to be a happy environment. Right? What Satoshi Nakamoto was able to invent was a system where the money is decentralized, not the double ledger accounting, right? Uh, but what they call the triple ledger accounting. So they had to invent a new type of accounting system so that the ledger can be distributed to all node operators, right? Uh, in the Bitcoin world, in the Bitcoin universe. So from a world of centralized money, you now have, for the first time in human history, right? A truly decentralized form of money. So what you have is, oops, sorry scarcity in the digital realm, right? Can you imagine the value of this scarce asset in the 21st century, right? The 20th century brought us right, the digitalization of the information exchange protocol through the internet. The language didn't change, right? But the medium changed. So during the Middle Ages, right, there was a similar change in the printer. Right, uh, from the handwritten manuscripts of the monks to uh, Gutenberg's movable type printing, and that brought you to the Reformation. Right? Uh, that's exactly what happened with the internet. But that's an alteration of the medium for the information exchange protocol or for the idea exchange protocol. For the 21st century, the next important change will be a change in the money. So today you now have right, digital scarcity, a permissionless global digital monetary system that nobody can control. Right. right. So framework number 11. Uh, this, is a this is a realization that, that, that came to me when I was doing my research for the book. Surprisingly, uh, the guy who gave me the insights to write this paper, this particular chapter in the book, was Karl Marx. Karl Marx spent a lot of his time talking about the virtue of gold as a form of money. And I was, as I was reading it, I realized that the foundation of his labor theory of value was exactly was his understanding of gold. Uh, he came up with contestable conclusions, of course, but the foundation of his theory of labor is essentially based on sound money, right? Why? Why is this so important? Because of the circular pattern of energy, work, labor, and money. Let me explain this. If you're an individual in an island, you know you're self-sufficient. You produce your uh, housing, food, and shelter, right? Uh, food, shelter, clothing on your own, right? Uh, there's no need to exchange value. There's no need for any form of money. Right. Your work is your own. You are a general purpose survivor. Right? As you scale with family, community, society, 
right? Uh, wait. Right? You're going to move from a world of generalization where individuals are able to do everything to a world of specialization. Why? Because you're trying to uh, become energy efficient. I can't do everything on my own, but if we work together, doing different things, right, we can specialize and we create more, therefore build an economy. So from a world of generalists, people will become specialists. For that to happen, you need to have a form of money. Otherwise, you're only going to have barter, which is a very inefficient communication exchange protocol. So your work, which is your individual effort, converting energy in the physical realm, meaning physical energy, using what you eat to convert it into your work, once deployed in a community, it gets transformed into labor. It becomes politicized, right? Here is my, <laughs> my deepest realization of what Marx meant or what I think Marx meant. There is a rule of equivalence, right? You convert energy into something, and that is your work. In an economy, you deploy that as labor, and if you're going to use money, you will need to have money that you can trust as an equivalent of your work. Bitcoin is the perfect money because Bitcoin relies on energy, right, to protect the soundness of its protocol. Compare that to a form of money that governments can inflate any time and every time based on the national interest or uh, the urgencies of the moment. Right, so the whole of labor law is based on this, the non-degradation principle, right? If I work and I get paid, I should be able to retain the value of my labor. If the value of my labor is debased, how? Through transmission cost. I'm sending from Hong Kong to the Philippines. It loses 16%, right? I'm sending from uh, Manila to Baler. I'm wasting one hour of my time going to Luillier, right? And all those types of hindrances to the efficient transmission of the value of your labor, you're going to have social movements. The only form of money that can maintain that non-degradation principle is Bitcoin. Okay, let me go to the problem of social media. Okay, social media. Right. Uh, Bitcoin will trigger a transformation in the way we consume social media. Why? Here is the problem with social media. Number one, the attention-seeking algorithms, right? The algorithm controls you. You don't control the algorithm, right? Uh, the algorithm is meant to seek attention because that is how right, value is monetized from the system. And so people posting, right? Uh, or creating content, right? To seek attention because that is the only way to monetize, right? Uh, the social network. And that changes behavior, right? Number two, we know that divisiveness, right? Is good for social networks, right? So the worry about polarization, right? Uh, is not the worry of social media companies. Why? Because it drives traffic to their networks. They have no economic incentive right, uh, to make people united. The economic incentive is to divide. Why? Because as more people hate on each other and dunk on each other on Twitter or on Facebook, the more that network is used. Right? Number three, the lack of incentive to police disinformation. This information is money for social networks, right? This information is money. And so at the base of these platforms, right, 
is a drive to make a lot of money from ads, from boosting of posts, etc. And misinformation is a very good tool for, well, for getting certain points done. Shadow banning and suspensions. Uh, we know this from uh, Twitter, right? Uh, there are a lot of people who, for example, complained about the unfairness of mask mandates, right? Uh, mask mandates or uh, the problems with the vaccines, right? Were shadow banned and suspended, even though they were highly credentialed, you know, uh, doctors from uh, the United States and Europe and, and India. Why? Because Uh, of number six, no? the problem of centralization. Uh, I think Elon Musk recently stated that uh, prior prior to his takeover of Twitter, uh, the government practically had access to information on that platform, including the direct messages. Right? So that is a big problem, right? And then, of course, the system of monetization. The system of monetization is quite perverse, right? Uh, for you to make money out of a social platform, you need to get people's attention by, by saying wild stuff, by, by doing a lot of crazy things, right? Because that is how you get attention. That is how the algorithm will favor you to drive traffic towards you. Once you become influential enough, that's how you get paid by the network. And why is that very important for the network? Because the more attention you get, the more data they can get from you, meaning the data of those who go to your platform or to your, your, your Facebook page or your TikTok page, right? And that data is sold by these corporations to advertisers. So human beings are basically converted into batteries, right? Uh, to drive advertising, to monetize, basically attention. So a, a prominent Bitcoiner, you know, has said that the, the current or prior to Bitcoin, the currency of the internet basically was attention. It's through attention that you can monetize, right, uh, your influence in on social media. How will Bitcoin change this, right? Uh, of course, the last is of course state capture, right? Uh, anyone who's heard of Noster? Familiar with Noster? Two people, uh, three people. Uh, Noster is a protocol, just like Bitcoin. Uh, it can be converted into a social media protocol. What's interesting about this protocol, it can be just like any other social media, just like Twitter, uh, just like Facebook. It can be a market tool uh, it can be anything actually, depending on how the developer right, uh, creates the client. What's interesting about this is this. Right. How I was able to monetize my idea. Right. For this particular idea, someone sent me 1,000 Satoshis because he liked the idea. So this is a social media with its own payment rail. That is an absolute game changer. Uh, Elon Musk bought Twitter for 44 billion, and his goal is to find a way to monetize, right? Uh, attention on Twitter. He cannot do that because he doesn't have a payment rail. Uh, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, tried to create uh, money, right? That's Libra, right, on Facebook they shut him down. Why? Because they can. And they know that it would be very difficult to allow private corporations to create their own forms of money. But this is a protocol that they cannot stop. Right? This is a global payments rail with a social media right, uh, protocol. Right? This is the dream of Elon Musk, basically. And this is for free, this is open, this is permissionless, right? Uh, there's no algorithm that tries to control you so that they can monetize the data that you provide the algorithm. The data is yours and you can monetize it however which way you want. 
This is freedom on the internet. This is decentralized social media. Right? It's not yet big, but just look at the characteristics of this type of a, a protocol compared to Facebook, TikTok, uh, Twitter. Right? So Bitcoin is going to change the consumption and production of information as it changes the consumption and production of value. When those two things change, you're going to have a technological revolution. And when you have a technological revolution, you're going to have a shift in civilization. Right. So my last framework for understanding Bitcoin is how it's going to change the nature of rights how it's going to change the way we understand law, how it's going to change the subjects that we teach, not just in law school, but in economics, finance, anthropology, psychology departments, basically all departments. Why? Why, why is it so powerful? Because it exists at the most fundamental level. When the language changes, everything changes. When the money changes, everything changes. And so the subjects that we teach, constitutional law, taxation, uh, corporation law, obligations and contracts, they're just apps, right? They're just apps that exist on a device with a protocol. This is the protocol, and it's changing, and it's here already. The nature of rights, all rights that exist today uh, the subject that I taught for 20 years, no? constitutional law. Uh, the subject that uh, Emmer and Dean Pangalangan teaches, no? uh, international law, right? uh, the nature of rights, are, are items or forms of discourses that exist as a consequence of the Westphalian system of states. Right? So all the rights that you have at the domestic level and at an international level are rights that require an intermediary, right? You need the state to enforce it. You need the court system to enforce it. You need conventions, right? Uh, and, 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 and protocols, right? To recognize a particular right. Bitcoin is the first global public registry of rights outside of that entire system. Imagine how powerful it is. It's a global public system of rights where you can record your rights transfer your rights in a permissionless, digital, global way. No? What is special about Bitcoin is this. No? Why will it survive? You say, for example, well, there's no way the states are going to allow that. Right? It's too radical. It's too revolutionary. Well, here is the thing about Bitcoin. Uh, the protocol itself, right? or at least the initial iteration of the protocol, uh, came from the generosity of Satoshi Nakamoto. Right? Uh, he worked for it apparently for about one and a half years, or they worked for it for about one and a half years, and then unleashed it to the world. Right? The way it is maintained, however, rests not on good sense or altruism, but purely on self-interest. And that is what is remarkable about Bitcoin as a network. That's why Ralph Merkel refers to it as a living organism on the internet. Why? Because it converts basically human beings into zombies <laughs> trying to feed the network. Uh, why would you want to become a miner to sustain and protect the network? Why? Because you want Bitcoins, right? Why would you want to become a node operator? Because you want to validate transactions. Why would you want to have Satoshis or Bitcoin? Because you understand the value of scarcity. So every participant in the network is a self-interested participant. They're not doing it for the good of humanity, even if the effect is a global public commons. Right? Uh, talking about global public commons, right? So Bitcoin enacts a system of rights without intermediaries. So you want to talk about free speech, freedom of association. Every time it gets infringed, you need to go to court. 
every time you go to uh, go out on the streets to protest, you're petitioning the government for redress of grievances. This system of rights is entirely different because it doesn't require intermediaries. It doesn't require the state at all. As this network grows, the power of the state diminishes. As more and more people go to this particular universe, right, they will dump that protocol that powers the state and transfer to this protocol. Why? Because it's simply a better protocol. Like I said, no, dumb protocol wins. So when, when people say, oh, you know, Bitcoin is good for money laundering. Bitcoin is good for buying drugs or illegal drugs. Bitcoin is good for uh, ordering people to kill other people, right? Uh, the answer to that is, if you're using a will, are you going to prohibit the use of a will because it can be used to kill other people? Uh, if you're using email, are you going to prohibit the use of emails because it can be used to communicate libelous content? Right. Uh, if you're using a printer, are you going to shut down all printers in the world because it can be used to communicate uh, heretic views? Right. Bitcoin as a protocol is similar to that. It's not a software, it's a protocol almost identical, even more important than the printer, right, or the wheel. It's a dumb protocol. It doesn't care, right? It doesn't care what it's used for. It simply exists, right? Also, the design is you cannot stop it anyway, right? So it's going to change the right system as we know it. Why? Because uh, as you're using the banking system, right? Uh, you have to undergo AML and KYC, right? And the, the rhetoric is, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, what's wrong about being subjected to AML and KYC? Now let's convert that to language, right? You want to say something. Would you want the government to hear it first before you say it? Oh, then you're going to complain about violation of your free speech rights. It's exactly the same with money. If you have a form of money using a type of medium that allows an equivalence between the kind of rights you envision in the world of ideas to the language, uh, to the kind of rights that you can envision in the world of value, you will make that argument. In about a few years' time, you know, uh, AMLK will see would be, right, uh, what? A legacy of the past, right? That's going to happen. Why? Because if they cannot stop it anyway, right, they will adjust. Innovation doesn't adjust to the legal system. The legal system follows the innovation, especially if the legal system cannot stop it. So the dumb protocol will win. The same way that the will will win, in the same way that the printer will win, in the same way that TCP IP has won, Bitcoin will win. Right. So talk about the commons. You know, when we speak about the commons, the air, uh, the Antarctica, uh, human rights, right? all those commons require either intermediaries or stewards. Right? You want to protect the Antarctica, you need to have an agreement among states to protect Antarctica. You want to protect the high seas, you need to have the UNCLOS right, as a convention for uh, determining the levels of stewardship or the details of stewardship. You always have to have an intermediary either to enforce the right or to maintain right, uh, the commons. Otherwise, you end up with the tragedy of the commons. Bitcoin creates a system of commons without intermediaries. With self-interest, right, Bitcoin will survive. That's how powerful it is. It doesn't require a state or an institution to protect it. It will survive because miners will want to use energy, right, because they want Bitcoins. Node operators will want to set up their nodes because they want permissionless transactions and an ability to validate every transaction, right? 
Uh, and Bitcoiners will want Bitcoin simply because they see it as a good store of value, uh, payment system, and the unit of account. I think that's the end of my presentation, right? So the best way to look at Bitcoin is uh, as money, right? But from a more theoretical standpoint, right? The best way to look at Bitcoin is as a rights transmission system, right? With speed, cost, and high fidelity transmission mechanism. Compare that with fiat, there's no way fiat can survive this system. Well, at least that's my thesis. Thank you and good afternoon. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, May 16th Justice. <laughs> there are several questions actually in the slide, though. Um, let's do this, uh, do this alternatively. You have questions from the floor. Are there questions from the floor? Let's do alternate, okay? Um, Professor De Castro. Good morning, sir. Yes. Can, I, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. So, first, an observation. Uh, I'm always amused whenever I hear about gold and how it's uh, nice. As a chemist, um, I, 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 before I, I was, I became a lawyer. I, I was a chemist, and to, to chemists. Um, gold is just, it's kind of useless. It's just shiny and heavy, right? So in that sense, it's also quite, it's also fiat money. We attach the value to it, which is quite also subjective. Yes. So all money in essence is all the value we can attach to money is subjective, except for energy, because energy, we can convert that to movement. We can convert, we can use it in actual physical phenomena. All right. So that's. Yes, yes. In, for example. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, the energy itself is objective, but the value is subjective. For example, a, a litigation lawyer in. Uh, in, during wartime is useless, or the services of a litigation lawyer during wartime is useless. But that litigation lawyer can store uh, their, the value of their work over time. But this is my question. Every thesis must have an antithesis uh, for it to be to, to survive. So without caring for this antithesis, may I propose uh, another framework so that we can test the idea, sir? Is it okay? What about, what if we look at money, fiat money, and the uh, systems that it props up as if it were, like you mentioned earlier, an organism. For example, you showed graphs earlier, sir, that uh, where the value of, or the money supply of peso and uh, the dollar is increasing almost exponentially over time, right? But there seems to be a, presumption there that the value of overall value or, value or the sum of the value of every human service, work, or good seems to be flat. And it becomes debased, the value of money becomes debased if the value of every human interaction is flat, right? In other words, yes, sir. Actually, if you attended my, my presentation in Boracay, I would have answered you already. Uh, the way I describe fiat, fiat is a form of money with a congenital disease. That congenital disease is inflation. It has to die. It has to die because it's, as the monetary units increase, that means that the value of the goods and services it's trying to measure, it's getting distorted. Right. And if you have a form of money that is just like a mirror, perfectly able to reflect the value of the goods and services in that economy, people will shift to that system. Right, sir. So if we, for example, look, if we consider an organism, a child, for example, a child during this slice of time will have a finite uh, currency of red blood cells. But if you use a finite number, say that the number of those red blood cells is 21 million at 
when that child is living. If you use the same 21 million when that child becomes uh, an adult, that child may become anemic, right? And it might result in apoptosis or hypoxia. And uh, what I'm saying here is, what I'm counter-proposing is maybe that, uh, that inflation is a byproduct of growth or that imperfect reflection between value and, uh, yes, sir. Uh, that's what, what the Keynesians would say. Uh, but I think what we're seeing now is the effect of that theory. Yes. Bank failures, uh, high levels of inflation all over. Uh, I think in, in the next few weeks and months and years, uh, you will see more and more people trying to understand Austrian economics. Because once the theory fails what people see in reality, which is what they're seeing now, they will look for a better way to explain things. Uh, for, for Bitcoiners, reality today is really easy to explain. Uh, it's the debt-based system starting to implode, yeah. right? Uh, all these bank failures, all these bailouts, right? Uh, that's a system trying to survive near-death experiences. Yeah. And there's a better way out, sound money. That's yes, Bitcoin. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Let Thank me you. read the first question. Do you, think, uh, um, do you think central bank digital currencies will, as they develop over time, erode the viability of Bitcoin as a store of value and inflation hedge? <laughs> I didn't want to talk about that. Uh, it's one of the topics to talk about. Um, I think that for the next maybe 20, 50 years, uh, the biggest fight in the world will be Bitcoin versus central bank digital currencies. Uh, why, why, why are nations trying to shift to a central bank digital currency? It's because there's something wrong with the fiat system. And as fiat system is about to run out of breath, they will need to invent something new, right? And that is central bank digital currency. And so central bank digital currency is essentially a, a cryptocurrency that is controlled by government. And that cryptocurrency can be used as a way to not only surveil you, but alter your behavior and regulate your behavior. Uh, so I'm talking to a Bitcoiner in Sweden who complains about uh, the cashless system that they have today. Uh, if you want to move in Sweden, use the, the train system, you need to use your ID. And that ID is used for the payments as well. So the government can surveil your movement, right? Uh, CBDCs can be used as a tool for enforcing a social credit system. Uh, if you're anti-government, for example, or if you said something controversial, or if you have a belief system that is quite outrageous to the mainstream or to the government, they can increase the interest rate on your loan they can prevent you from having access to the financial system. They can kick you out of the, th the real system. They can unbank you entirely. And so CBDCs, is, CBDCs I think, are, are, will result in digital panopticon, right? uh, a world where all your transactions are policed by the state. And so again, you go back to the problem, uh, to the, the retort. If you're not doing anything wrong, uh, why don't you want the government to surveil your economic activities? And the answer to that is, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, why don't you allow the police to enter your house, your bathroom, right, and your bedroom? It's the same argument. Thank you, sir. So you have a question. Yeah, please use the microphone. If you don't mind, we'd like to ask you to identify yourself, please. Thank you. <laughs> Bitcoiners really hate that. <laughs> For record lang so, academic purposes. <laughs> That's exactly the problem. But no, no, I'm just joking. 
Thank you for covering so much uh, territory in your talk in such a clear way. Really amazing. Thank you. Uh, I have to say I was triggered by it uh, in a positive way because uh, it gave me a lot of thinking on threats. And one threat, um, I'd actually like to mention two threats and ask if you could respond to at least one of them. Um, the first one I think you more or less touched on here, which is the threat to Bitcoin of uh, Bitcoin 2, another version, which uh, is more powerful and has a tweak. Um, it's, the system is easily copied. So um, why doesn't, how is Bitcoin going to survive a threat like digital, uh, bank digital currencies or Bitcoin 2 if the whales get behind it or if it uses energy better? could come along and replace it because it's easily copied. So that's threat number one. And I'd like to mention threat number two because it's triggered by your talk and also by a comment overnight from Elon Musk. Um, what happens if they teach AI how to lie? So I'm going to add to that. What happens if they teach AI how to lie and how to trade Bitcoin? Might AI wind up own, owning all the Bitcoins and then do we become slaves? Okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really starting. Okay. I'll answer the first question, right? Uh, because I'm still studying AI, uh, and I don't think I've reached a sufficient level of confidence to, to, to talk about it. Uh, but I'll answer the first question. You, you can copy the, bo the, the, the protocol of Bitcoin because it's open source but you cannot copy the network. Uh, the same way that you can create another Wikipedia, but you cannot create, you cannot copy the, the network, you know, that supports or powers uh, Wikipedia. Um, so the answer is still the same. The best network wins in terms of uh, speed, cost, and fidelity. Uh, I don't think you can reinvent Bitcoin. It's impossible to reinvent Bitcoin, uh, given the immaculate conception of Bitcoin, the fact that Satoshi Nakamoto has already left. Right? Uh, there's no other what, coder in the world that can do that again and build the human layer that is the Bitcoin network today. So I don't think it's copyable. Uh, you have what? 22,000 other cryptocurrencies. Uh, all of them are founders who are basically named. Uh, and so if you're looking at a permissionless system that is truly decentralized, that has no names, if you're looking for a money without any masters in terms of a named coder, uh, there's no way you can copy that again. You can't, you can't have a Bitcoin 2.0 but you can copy the code and create Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin Satoshi Vision and all the other hundreds of Bitcoin copycats. And I think the market has already spoken as well. Uh, for the past 14 years, it's only been Bitcoin in terms of the amount of value, fiat value that's been invested on, on the, the network. In terms of the health of the network, it's remained the same the characteristics of Bitcoin has remained the same. And that's precisely what you want for a stable monetary network, something that doesn't change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, due to lack of time, we'll just have to read two questions, answer two questions in relation to fidelity. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, like I said, Bitcoin and fiat are two separate networks. When you say Bitcoin is volatile, that means you see bit, you see Bitcoin in fiat terms, right? So Bitcoin today is what twenty eight thousand dollars. I'm gonna ask these guys how much thirty thousand dollars from about fifteen thousand dollars last December, right? So you see that as a volatility to the upside. Oh, Bitcoin is very volatile. It actually went down from 69,000 in 2021 to 15,000. I'm not gonna put my money in such a volatile asset. 
that's because you're looking at it from the viewpoint of someone who's within the fiat world. Like I said earlier, right? If you're in the Bitcoin universe and you have, say, one million sats, uh, it's very difficult to find a whole, co whole coiner today, right? Except for, I'm not gonna, say <laughs> I'm not gonna name names, right? Uh, if you have one Bitcoin today, that means that since 2009 up until today, your relationship with the Bitcoin universe hasn't changed. Why? Because it's still 21 million Bitcoins. So, like I said earlier, that's a place of Zen. That's a place of peace and quiet because in this particular universe, your relationship with all the other Bitcoiners hasn't really changed. Uh, it's very difficult to think that way because most of us today still live in the fiat world. Uh, I get my salary in fiat. Uh, most of us here today will will buy goods and services in fiat, right? Uh, but there's a growing community of people who are starting to live almost exclusively in this other universe. And they're growing and growing and growing. And the only difference between them and the rest of humanity is knowledge, <laughs> basically. Uh, once they understand you know, what I discussed, assuming I'm right, and I'd like to think that I am, right, then the entire cohort of non-Bitcoiners will shift to this universe. And it's a universe where no government can take your money away from you, where your money is really your money. Your work cannot be based by inflation, right? Where you can travel anywhere and everywhere with 12 words in your head. Thank you, sir. We'll have this as the last question. If you have some more questions, please, uh, we will ask Dean Hilbay to answer them through email. You can oh. email you. <laughs> the, the unanswered questions. Okay. The unanswered questions. Um, we do not know your email, so please email us at iaj underscore UPD. Okay. This is a very good question. I'll answer it. Oh. Right. Uh, uh, so, so JJ, what do you want? The, the, the real answer or the, the safe answer? <laughs> Uh, well, there are several ways to look at it. Uh, one way of looking at it is at some point, maybe Bitcoin becomes um, a global asset that is a world reserve currency, but not humanity's cash, not necessarily. Meaning uh, it becomes like any other currency. So a global citizen or a, a digital nomad, for example, uh, we'll start living in the Bitcoin standard or on the Bitcoin standard as more and more merchants, as more and more merchants start accepting Bitcoin, right? Everything will be priced in Bitcoin. Uh, it depends also on how the states will react. If the states react in such a way as to try to ban the on-ramps and the off-ramps, then they're basically impaling themselves, right? If it's the United States that tries to do that, then it's gonna be, I think, very painful for Americans. Every country in the world that has made a mistake with respect to the choice of the global reserve asset has suffered economically and materially. And so, yeah, so Bitcoiners love to talk about the game theoretic implications of Bitcoin becoming the global reserve asset and the world's unit of account. Uh, it might happen, it might not happen, or it just might become you know, a source of discipline for all governments. Now that there's a real alternative that is sound money in the digital world, where people will have access to that form of money, then it might make governments more disciplined. I'm not sure that's going to, to happen, right? Uh, my personal take is that slowly but ever so surely, right? Everyone will simply shift to uh, a Bitcoin universe and that transition will happen 
depending on the number of Bitcoiners in every community. That's why for me, it's so crucial to build the human layer here in the Philippines because if we're able to understand this early enough, then, then Filipinos will be protected when that transition happens. And it can happen anytime, given the, the pace and the intensity with which uh, China, the United States, China's allies and the United States allies are, are projecting their forces. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have, so. May I ask? Thank you. May I ask um, former ICC judge, former dean, Raul Pangalangan, to hand our certificate? Uh, the, the person certificate responsible for me becoming a member of the UP Law faculty uh, is Dean Raul Pangalangan. He was the one who took a chance oh. on a new graduate of the College of Law. <laughs> yeah, and open, and open the academic world to me. So I'm forever grateful to my mentor. Thank you. Prof. Manias, please. <laughs> Let's read this. University of the Philippines College of Law, University of the Philippines Institute of Judicial Administration of Justice awards the Certificate of Appreciation to Dean Florin T. Hilbay in recognition of his invaluable knowledge, expertise, and time as resource speaker for the lecture on the topic Understanding Frameworks for Bitcoin. Given this 19th day of April 2023 at the UP College of Law, UP Diliman, Quezon City, signed Professor Emerson S. Banyas, Director of the Institute of Administration of Justice. Thank you very much, Dean Hilbay. <laughs> to all the participants, to those uh, who are present here and to those uh, who are at YouTube and watching us uh, through YouTube and UP College of Law website, maraming maraming salamat po for joining us. Okay, <laughs> to end the program, may we call, I, Professor Banyas is here already, sir, for some brief remarks. By way of closing remarks. Oh, so <laughs> thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Right. So, uh, closing statement. <laughs> uh, I'll just tell a story uh, from the time I was uh, one of Dean Hilby's unofficial, unpaid research assistants. <laughs> Uh, along with Naina Malayang, uh, she was the one who recruited me into his team. Uh, so Naina and I helped him out with several pleadings that were filed before the Supreme Court. I think I remember those days. We, you know, for for this particular instance, we we had to we had to call Dean Raul on a Sunday <laughs> so that we could borrow his printer. Right? Uh, I I uh, I think we finished one of those pleadings around two in the morning. And H, we called him H uh, during that time, was kind enough to drive me and Naina to our respective uh, places. Well, he was supposed to anyway. Uh, see, I was so tired uh, that I fell asleep at the back of his car. When I woke up, I could feel the warmth of sunshine on my face. And I could feel we were still accelerating in a straight line. So I asked groggily, H, where the hell are we? And he said, we're halfway through Pangasinan. We're on our way to Baguio. Right? Nina pointed out that, you know, H loves going on these impromptu adventures. You know? I don't have enough time, unfortunately, to even summarize that trip. Uh, suffice it to say that it was legendary. By the end of that trip, I was broke, I was injured, and I was late for enrollment. But I learned a lot, and I had, you know, I had so much fun. We even forgot to <laughs> to return uh, Dean Raul's printer. Uh, you know, after that, I always had an overnight kit with me, right? uh, ready for another adventure. I suppose that you know sort of encapsulates uh, H as you know as a teacher and as a boss, right? Uh, 
if you are you know if if you are if you are prepared yeah, and if you are open to the call of adventure right he will lead you to very interesting places yeah you know as long as you don't forget to bring a towel right so thank you very much thank you thank you dean thanks everyone Thank, thank you, Professor Emmer. May I invite everybody, please, to stand so, and join us to, in the singing of the Yupi Naming Mahal. Just a few announcements. The UPIAJ conducts monthly continuing legal education programs. Our um, May pro April program and May programs uh, will be, f uh, that's the April program. We have the May program also. You can follow us, please, at um, our Facebook page. <laughs> we, ha we also have the UP College of Law website. Our July program focuses on artificial intelligence and technology. It's open to both lawyers and non-lawyers, so please attend if you're interested. Details will be posted soon at the UP Law website and the UP uh, Facebook page. Um, what else? For the venue, Dean Hilbay, we'd like to request you to do the book signing, please, <laughs> right after this affair. Okay, again, thank you, everyone for attending uh, and joining us in this afternoon's lecture. Maraming maraming salamat po. Please go around UP. Sunken Garden. <laughs>